Commerce Podcast is supported by viewers, listeners, and businesses just like you. Michelle Parno has lived and worked in Lake Forest for over two decades. Michelle's lending experience when combined with her real estate expertise makes her an invaluable asset to her clients as they navigate their home buying or selling process. Call Michelle now at 847-528-8721, 847-528-8721. For the best cannabis in the world, look no further than Iliad Epic Grow. Owned by Lake Bluff's own Rich Ruzich, they are a cannabis cultivation center focusing on hard-to-find small batch products that will delight both the occasional user and Ganjie. When visiting Michigan, ask for it by name, Epic Products, Exceptional Process. For more information, email info at iliadgrow.com. Laracy and Company CPAs, founded in 2010 by Lake Forest's own Brian Laracy, specializes in tax preparation and bookkeeping services. Earning the People Love Us on Yelp Award, their process is straightforward. Just upload, review, and file. For a free quote, visit LaracyCPA.com now. That's L-A-R-I-S-E-Y-C-P-A.com. I'm excited to share with you something special from our Lake Forest community, the Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa, located at 775 North Bank Lane in Lake Forest near Wisconsin Avenue. This just isn't any spa. They offer an amazing blend of traditional spa services, plus the added benefit of medical procedures and treatments. In a relaxing and luxurious spa environment, you can enjoy a range of cosmetic and aesthetic treatments. These are all performed under the supervision of top medical professionals. The Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa provides skin care, facial rejuvenation, body contouring, laser hair removal, Botox, dermal fillers, chemical peers, and much more. What's great is that each treatment is tailored not just to enhance your appearance, but also to address specific skin concerns and to promote overall well-being. So if you're looking to pamper yourself and take your beauty routine to the next level, give the Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa a call at 224-768-8028 or visit them at their location on North Bank Lane. It's an experience your skin will thank you for. We'd also like to say we're thankful for our Patreon supporters, Otto, John C., Helen, Herrick, and J.M. What's up, Playa? Another Good room. Good morning. Another room. Room with a view. <laughs> That's light. Dan McConchie. Well, that'd be our first Hockey time. McConchie. Look it up. McConchie. McConchie. You looked it up. Yeah, I'm a cat. I look at the stuff that you send, and then I look at his stuff on PBS, and I'm like, all right, rant. Where yeah. We... His stuff on PBS? Yeah. <laughs> well, from 2021. I mean, What's he got on PBS? Oh, I oh, could... mean, when he was running, or? No, he was, they couldn't get any congressman on, so he was the only one who would go on PBS. Is your Wi-Fi good there, dude? It's a Ward 3 guy, I think. He's last name. I don't know. Your, your Wi-Fi is spotty there. It's got the best I got. Uh, Well, are you closer to your Wi-Fi or farther away, or does not matter? I'm I, I'm as close as I can be. Okay. Then uh, we, let's so, see. see I, I I'll tell the kid. I'll tell everyone to get off the Wi-Fi. How's that? You want to talk about that bridge? Oh, in Baltimore? Why Why are we paying for that bridge? To make the insurance companies happy? Isn't it a, isn't it a federal highway? No, people are bitching that we're bailing out the insurance company. Lives in Hawthorne Woods. Neighbors to our west. Yeah, his district goes right up against um, Lake Forest and that he'd like to have Lake Forest in his district. You know, he got reelected last time by 400 votes. That's pretty good. That's something they ask him about. That's something they ask him about the, the GOP uh, GOP future. Well, we can talk about that when we talk about Lake County State Attorney's race. How's the GOP winning? How does the GOP win back the suburbs? Because his his his, his, his rate his Senate seat is an example of years ago. Years ago, the Democrats didn't even put anybody up against him, and now they you know. Each each time he runs, and he's not up again till twenty twenty six, but each time he runs, that his margin the margin of victory there by the Republican nominee, whether it's him or its predecessor, shrinks. So what's happening there? That's that's a fair question to ask him. 
And how do you well, reverse that? How does he offer jobs? I'm sure, he's got. Some, I know he's got some ideas. People in this area don't. People in this area don't want jobs. That's a city thing. People no, here don't want packages. political jobs. You can't anymore. They don't really have them anymore either, Pete. The the the, the federal courts have barred a lot of that. They don't have what they used to have. I'm telling you, Pritzker does not give out as many jobs as. Well, this he Pritzker probably doesn't give out as many. Course. Has as many. I, Jim Thompson, well, those are, yeah, those are appointments, and that's something we want to talk to him about. Yeah. So, But yeah. that's not really a job. I, you know, like a guy working at IDOT or at, uh, you know, labor. Years ago, somebody working at the tollway was a political hack. Today, they're not. Does the prison review board get paid? There was probably more. I don't know. It's a good question to ask him. Let me get him on. Said he was coming. Well, I'm sure he's making sure that he's maximizing every minute of his day. Got a long day today. Show What's us this tomorrow. measles outbreak in Chicago. I know. Wait, what? Oh, you got a oh, uh, what show you got tomorrow? Reggie's in Chicago, South State State Street. Oh, Hopefully I don't get uh, my car jacked. Take the train. I don't think you can at that. Yeah, hour. then then I well then I get my amp and my guitar stolen. I'm excited to hear George. Yeah, he's all pumped up about the survey. The survey about well, how- his point his point is a good one. He goes, "Why when you have 98 percent of the residents either overwhelmingly or somewhat approving uh, the how things are in the town? Why would you change anything in the town?" Why would you change the caucus? Why would you boot out? No, he's gonna. He's not gonna rag on the caucus. He's gonna say, "Why would? Why would you change officers? Why would you not? Wouldn't you? Well, then why would you change the process? He's he's pro Oridi. Of course we are, but well, they're trying to change the that. process. So you're saying why change anything? Right. Well, because they felt that the crew bots hijacked the process. But I'll let him explain that. Here's Dan. The pride of Hawthorne Woods. So Dan McConkey. Did I say that right? We have him on. Check, check, check. He's coming in. He's coming in. He's tuning in. There he is. Good morning. I just got Good morning, Senator. Are we recording this for audio only or video as well? For both to see your smiling face, Senator. You mean I was supposed to comb my hair today? You look good. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> look, look at us. What are you worried about, Senator? <laughs> this is the premise. He of has show. that hat permanently glued to his head. Well, I'm always thinking. Unlike some po- politicians on the other end of the aisle. Just think of this as, you know, three guys showing up at the bar. We're talking about what's going on in town. And, you know, we're in Lake Forest and. You know, Hawthorne Woods, our neighbors to the west. We got the senator in, and we're going to talk about things. Welcome to the show, Senator Dan McConkey, Hawthorne Woods. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, it Senator. Is a, it is a Thank good you for morning. joining us. Joe, you have brought this fine gentleman on the show. What? Yeah. Courtesy of our of our mutual friend uh, and previous guest, Lake County. County Republican Chairman Keith Brin. Okay. Um, we wanted you to have you on. Um, your district does not include Lake Forest, but it goes right up to Lake Forest, I believe, Senator, or pretty close to it, right? Uh, <clears throat> pretty close. I go over into the Libertyville area. Vernon Hills. I think you got Vernon Hills. Uh, that's and, under the uh, previous map. You still have Matawa. Under the old map, district? I had parts of Vernon Hills. Oh, previous map. But uh, they did move me a little bit west and north. Which is the Democrats. <laughs> uh, you've been in the state Senate since 2016. You were, for a couple of years, the, the Senate Republican leader uh, down in Springfield. Um, so I think in your district is pretty much all Lake County. I think it does go a little bit into Cook, if I'm not mistaken, but the, the lion's a, share of your district is Lake County. and Yeah, so my district's about 63% Lake County, then it goes into McHenry, Cook, and a bit of Kane. Okay. How did, how did the so, Republican win? Um, 
Uh, well, that funny story on that. I was the top vote getting Republican on the ballot. I outperformed the top of the ticket by 10 percentage points in my district. And in the last election cycle, after all the votes had been counted, I out of 89,000 cast, I won by 385 votes. So it's it's Whoa. been a, a it's been a bit of a challenge. I just wonder why why did you win? We're in uh, Illinois. You, know, you can't win. <laughs> um I have always been very practical and a pragmatic Republican. I've not been one who, you know, throws bombs or things of that sort. If there's an opportunity to work across the aisle in a actually meaningful and productive way, you know, I'll do that. And if uh, if the Democrats are doing something stupid, it's, there's always you know plenty of opportunities to to pick on something with that. I call them out on it, and I think people have appreciated my you know uh, just being honest with them and and being somebody who seeks to ref, uh, get things done and and uh, reflect them first. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm being elected to represent them not to represent myself uh down in the general assembly are they gonna are they gonna redistrict so they get more democrats in your in your area didn't they do that in the 10th joe well they did that every 10 years pete they do the redistricting okay. and I, I we just we just went through that what in 2020 so it'll be 2030 okay 30 again before we go through another round Okay, so we'll... it seems like each each year, each every ten years, the map gets a little worse for for the Republican Party uh, than the previous map, right? Well, I think what they do is they just they continue to be able to narrow in on you know the the techniques to really make it as you know gerrymandered and as partisan as they can be. Interestingly enough, I mean there was a a, a national group that studies. Uh, these things and said that we were the worst gerrymandered state in the entire country. Now you have to remember both Republicans and Democrats in the various places gerrymander, whether it's for uh, congressional seats or whether they do it for their state legislative seats. But you know, that's quite a feat, right? To be able to take the technology that now exists today to be able to really just zone in on those. I, I'll tell you that even the last map, it was interesting uh, there was a portion of my district in Mundelein in which uh, it went the it went around the corner and then literally went through someone's backyard and then came back out to the street and grabbed the next property and then went through the backyard of the next. It looked like a sawtooth going down the street. That's the level of detail that they get to as they are drawing these maps. Uh, former uh, state representative Tom Morrison, who had proven himself very effective at continually being able to be reelected in the Palatine area, found himself drawn out of his district by half a block. So it's, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they've made when, it into a science. That's when you sure. say they, who's they? Well, I say it's the powers of be, right? <clears throat> so in this case, it's the Democrats who are, uh, in control of the state. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because I, I sued right in federal court about this map. And so we got to put the map drawers, uh, the staff people who sat behind the scenes. We got to have them in a deposition and have them answer questions. And they said that what they did was that they brought in their members either one by one or, you know, uh, uh, what, yeah, one by one. And they'd say, OK, if you were drawing the district that you want for your area, what would that look like? And they would have these legislators give them some rough ideas on how to draw the district. And then as there were um, complaints or, or disagreements between one Democratic le legislator and the one that was next door, they then bring them both in together to negotiate the deal. And, and this is quintessentially where, uh, you know, the, a case of where individual politicians are selecting their own voters that they knew would maximize their chances to be able to maintain control. Uh, it's it's where the leaders pick pick their supporters rather than the than, than the constituents being able to pick who their elected leaders are. This is the premise for the show. We're in the bar, and it's more about finger pointing and pointing out problems, and then offering up solutions. Senator, how do we correct this, man? If you had a magic wand, what's the right way to do it? And then, Joe, continue with your notes on the show. 
So the, what you do with this is you, first, you need a constitutional amendment that says that you can't gerrymander maps, right? That you're drawing maps that are based on other criteria, whether it be, you know, municipal lines so the towns stay together or keeping counties together, areas downstate. Uh, you, you do that. You have a, a, a set of rules in regards to campaign finance that ensures that people can go out and raise the money they can. Here, here's one thing that a lot of people don't know about campaign finance rules in Illinois. So I have a cap. If I go out and I raise money from an individual, the maximum amount of money that I can raise is $6,900 per person okay, or $13,800 per couple. That's the maximum that I can take in. However, what happens here is we have a self-funder rule. And so uh, the leaders will routinely give or loan themselves $100,001, remove the cap in their race, take in unlimited funds, and then the law allows them to make unlimited transfers to any other candidate they do. This is what Mike Madigan did, right? So there was a, a an individual who actually represented part of Lake County as a Democrat, did not support Mike Madigan for speaker in his second to last run. And uh, Mike Madigan went out, recruited another candidate and put millions of dollars into that opponent's uh, race in the primary. While this individual, a former federal prosecutor, was limited to $6,900 at a time. Right. So the system is made. It was made by Mike Madigan to be able to empower the leaders to be able to uh, really exercise ultimate control in this state. Well, and that and that representative you spoke of was, I believe, Scott Drury, yep, who his district included Lake Forest. So he he, <laughs> he was from Highland Park, I believe, but he um, he he represented Lake Forest, and now it is Bob Morgan, who I believe was the guy Madigan wanted. In yeah, there that's right. Then. Bob Morgan so, is the one that he, he yeah. was recruited. And, you know, it, it, it's a, it's an unfortunate circumstance. At the end of the day, it should be a level playing field. The districts should be, you know, just drawn in, in a manner not to maximize political gain, but to allow for people to choose their own person. And the rules around financing, whether you're going to have, you know, limits or no limits, you just got to pick one and allow everybody to uh, abide by the same rules in order to make it the democracy to work as effectively as it could. Who's going to sponsor this? Nobody's going to vote for it except, you well, know, the mi minority. Well, I've, I've sponsored it multiple okay. times. I've introduced it, right? We They don't even allow a hearing on it. They don't even assign the constitutional amendment to committee. There was an effort back in 20, uh, what was it, 2014, 2015, to try to get this on the ballot, right? So that people could choose to have uh, non-gerrymandered maps. And at the end of the day, uh, the Supreme Court on a partisan roll call, because we have we have partisan you know Supreme Court justices who run either as a Republican or as a Democrat, uh, voted it down. And these are the people that had, had their campaigns funded by Mike Madigan. Interestingly enough, you did have individuals who had long been very public supporters of uh, fair maps, who then suddenly at the last redistricting changed their mind. People like Julie Morrison, who, uh, Melinda Bush, Melinda Bush. It's it's unfortunate that that uh, we see that happen, but we do. I believe another person who changed their tune on it was was uh, J. B. Pritzker, if I'm not mistaken. Didn't he run saying he wanted redistricting reform, and then he signs Madigan's map into law? Yeah, in fact, he signed had to sign it multiple times because the first one got thrown out in federal court. So uh, <laughs> we redid it and sent it to the governor, and he signed it again. Well, a a big story this week. Um, a very sad story. Uh, uh, a young boy in Chicago was killed um, defending his mother uh, from, I, I think it was her ex-boyfriend who had just gotten out of jail or had been let loose. And yeah. uh, the the police chief, the Chicago police chief said this this kid had this guy had no business being out on the street. And there, there's more to the story with this Illinois Prisoner Review Board. Yeah. So for, for, for those people who don't know, so if you are a, uh, a, a someone who's sentenced to prison and, and you go to prison, your so, you know, judge sentenced you to, to a certain number of years. In this case, uh, Mr. Brand uh, um, was sentenced to 16 years in prison 
for uh, other violent related crime. You know, he has a long rap sheet, but he's sentenced to 16 years in prison. And after a certain period of time, the the law allows for most individuals sent to prison to be able to go for a parole hearing. And so for that, you go before the what's called the Prisoner Review Board. Now, we had, when I was a uh, Senate Republican leader, we fought pretty hard against some of the individuals that J.B. Pritzker had put forward because they were completely very radical people. I mean, he even put a convicted murderer onto the prisoner review board for a period of time, uh, who was then going went and voted to allow someone he had served time with to get out of jail. I mean, it, it you can't make this kind of stuff up, right? So, uh, so, so individuals, these individuals on the prisoner review board, they go around and they hear uh, the appeals saying, "Look, I'm reformed, and you know you should let me out." So, in this case, Mr. Brand uh, went through the parole board hearing and said, "You know, I'm I'm reformed," and they said, "Okay, you can go." So they let him out of jail, and a few weeks later, he begins texting his ex girlfriend, who uh, had since moved on, right, and she. She had two children. She was pregnant with child number three, four months pregnant. But he started texting her saying he was going to kill her and her family and things like this. So she files for an order of protection. This was then considered a, a violation of his parole. They sent him back to jail. A month later, they let him out of jail. And within 24 hours, he shows up at this woman's door, eight o'clock in the morning. She's getting the kids ready for school. She opens the door he barges in, begins stabbing her with a knife. This little 11-year-old boy, Jaden, uh, is trying to help his mom. He's he's trying to defend her. And Mr. Brand turns, attacks uh, the little boy, severs his carotid artery, and he dies. And it, it is an absolutely tragic story because this should have never happened, right? So first of all, I think that someone who has been is committed, has a, a rap sheet like this guy did, shouldn't be let out. But at the same time, even if you are going to say, okay, an individual in this case is reformed and let them out, and then they prove they're not and violate their parole by threatening violence, bodily harm, and death onto someone else, and then say, yeah, well, we're going to still let them out of jail. I mean, that is, it, this is, was so avoidable. And this just goes back to, to show, I mean, J.B. Pritzker, has been somebody he he signed the bill to get rid of bail right so that there's people walking the streets that really shouldn't be walking the streets today uh his prisoner review board people have have had some very questionable they've let cop killers out of jail they've they've let this guy out of jail who then turns around and kills this little boy it had had jb pritzker just done what i think every politician should do and that is prioritize the weak and defenseless over and above uh, the the criminals who are just merely claiming that they've been reformed, this little boy would be alive today. We had a Democrat on the show who was in the uh, sheriff's department. Uh, our buddy uh, Vince Vega or Anthony Vega, oh, uh, sure. Clerk Vega. And <laughs> when that safety act was was going through, he said that it was like pushed through in like a day or something. Like what? It, it was a lot voluminous. Is that the right word, Joe? Voluminous? Voluminous. Voluminous. Yeah. Huge stacks of information oh. that you have to process and understand <laughs> in, on, in in a weekend or something. Did that happen? And why is that happening, yeah. Senator? Well, this all had to do with the fact that um, Speaker Madigan was running for re-election, and he was having some problems with the... Uh, with the progressive members and the female members of his caucus, and he was looking for votes. And there was a, a group of members, particularly in the House, but then also in the Senate, who had, uh, if there was four different bills that they wanted through, one that had to do with health care reform, one that, you know, this one had to do with criminal justice reform. They had, and they rammed through the actual text of this language, yes, in a very short period of time. I think, if I remember correctly, I think we voted on this bill at six o'clock in the morning after being there all night. Nobody knew what what all was in it. It's had to have two or three trailer bills run since then just to try to clean up stuff. It, but, I mean, you know, Mr. Vega's boss at the time, our current county sheriff, uh, was one of the two 
was somebody who was supportive of it, as well as our state's attorney, uh, who uh, I'm very hope, hopeful hopeful that we can replace this time. The Trust Act was Rauner. The Safety Act was Pritzker. Okay, yeah. and there is a there is a difference between the Trust Act and the Safety Act. Um, the, great. The Trust great Act marketing. had to do with asking immigration status by law enforcement officers. How do we correct it? How do we shouldn't <laughs> but, there be a better uh, process Sen to dump this all in somebody's lap and you're up all night and that can't be a good way to do it? Is there anything now? Madigan's gone, right? I keep hearing Madigan. Remember, Senator, well, I don't know. I'm the guy at the end of the bar in my fourth Miller light, and I, you know, I'm hearing this stuff. I'm like, what the hell? Why is this stuff happening? How do we fix it? Uh, is there anything you can introduce or have you introduced that, you know what, you got to take more than a night to look at uh, 6,000 pages of information? I, I have introduced a constitutional amendment on that uh, specifically before that bills have to have at least 24 hours prior to being able to be voted on budgets, 72 hours because they're so big. I mean, look, in, in the last I, I do videos occasionally for social media and try to you know explain to people kind of what's going on down in Springfield. And one of the ones that was the most popular, if you add in all the different platforms together, it had about 130,000 views. It had to do with the last year's budget. I had a stack of paper this tall. You can't see it on here. But it, we had 3,500 pages of the budget uh, there. And in that one, we were given an overnight, which actually is a greater period of time. But there's been times in which we've had an hour, literally an hour to do that. And in the one one year when we had an hour, what we did is we brought the entire budget out to the Senate floor. And because there was no possible way to know what was in it, we, met, we would invite members, including those from the other side of the aisle, come over, grab a single sheet of paper from somewhere in the stack. And how much money was did you spend on that, you know, sheet of paper? I mean, you have to do little things like this at times just to kind of, uh, you know, joke about it or have fun. Otherwise, you just literally go in crazy. You got to you got to make these these important decisions on information unless you know what's going in there beforehand. Do you, do you have an idea what's in there at all or it's just... Oh, we don't. Not on the Republican side. No. I mean yeah, the Democrats okay. have some idea. But but I'll tell you, I mean it's not the way to 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 run a railroad. So one year there was a um a tax credit that should have been in the budget. They Madigan left it out of the budget and it was 2 weeks before somebody figured out that it was missing because it should have been in there, right? So in that case, you weren't looking for what necessarily is just written in the bill. You were looking for what wasn't written in the bill, right? In order to know if something had been forgotten that should have been put in. That That's part of the reason why these type of things with just an hour posting notice, you know, it really is a travesty for democracy. Senator, let's talk Eric Reinhardt, okay? <laughs> the guy at the end of the bar here, I, I've asked the guy to come on the show, and all, all I can do is get perceptions of what I hear. And what I hear is a guy that feels guilty that's in was in cahoots with Kim Fox that said, you know what, these poor people that are in jail, we should they don't need to put up cash bail because they don't have any money. We should let it let it go. Eric Reinhardt, I, I, my perception is, you know, he feels guilty in cahoots with Kim Fox. And you know what? I can get some votes maybe from criminals. What? How the hell do they put this cashless bail out there? Why? I, 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 I don't I don't understand. Even the, even uh, the, the, some of the Democrats don't understand it. There is something to be said about the fact that you don't want. You, you want people who need to report back to uh, court to have kind of a hook, a, a need, a reason to do that, right? The issue is making sure that you don't leave people unnecessarily in jail uh, who is are only there because they don't have a thousand bucks, right? And, and then they lose their job and perhaps then they can't make their car payment and then they lose their car. And as a result, then they go on to the system. I mean, we do have situations like that. But what most people don't really get or understand is the fact that judges have discretion, right? Judges have the ability to look at Joe's situation and go, wow, that's a really cheap suit. You probably can't afford more. And let's work with you to make sure that, you know, it's something that we can 
um, you know, that, that it will work, right? It's sufficient that you're going to come back and report back to court when you're supposed to and not just keep walking, but at the same time, um, doesn't leave people into a circumstance that unnecessary, uh, unnecessarily, which does happen sometimes. And so I do think that there is a balance that needs to be done there. What we did with the Safety Act was just completely throw everything out. And that was, again, based on a political calculation that was done at the time. There were some members of the General Assembly who saw a great opportunity to say, hey, you know, uh, Madigan needs votes. Here's a way in which we can extract what we want for our, you know, our communities. And uh, Madigan, you know, did it because... Um, it was a it was a last ditch effort for him to try to get the votes to remain speaker. Only two counties out of a, what, 106, 105, something? 102. 102. Yeah. OK, how? Why? Because that's where the, the biggest population is. I don't understand why you, those. Well, the law affects the whole state, Pete. I'm losing track now. Are we on the Safety Act or are we on the. Yeah. Uh, yes. OK. OK. Safety Act. So the Safety so, Act was supported by two states attorneys. Fox and. And Reinhardt, right? Reinhardt. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Joe, Joe, Joe froze again. But Give but everybody else said, you know what? Dumb idea. Am I is that right, Senator? Yeah. There were Democrat states attorneys who were uh were opposed to this. I mean, there was a big concern. Take take, for example, domestic violence, right? Yeah. So I'm a woman, I'm being beaten by my partner. And and we actually had a downstate female states attorney who brought this up. She she was talking about this was before the Safety Act was passed. She said in the past week, I've had an individual, a woman come to me who said, OK, I'm ready for you to come and take him. But here's the thing. I don't want you to come take him unless you can guarantee me that you can keep him, because if you can't keep him, I don't know what he'll do. I don't know. Will he come back and beat me worse? Will he kill me as a result? So I'm willing to press charges, but only if you can guarantee me that he'll stay in. And, and you know, this state's attorney was like, under the Safety Act, I won't be able to do that anymore. Right. And so how many circumstances do we have like this? And and that was a there was a downstate female Republican state's attorney. So I'm at a dinner in the western suburbs in Kane County, and I'm at a, a, a at a table with the Democrat female state's attorney who was there. And I said, hey, I've got a question for you. I told her what this other state's attorney, she said, had said, and she goes that she is absolutely correct. It is one of the reasons why I don't support the Safety Act. Female Democrat state's attorney did not support it because of the risk of, of domestic violence and, and other things to the weak and vulnerable because of how the Safety Act tied their hands and prevented them from being able to protect you know the innocent at the end of the day will there be changes we've made some changes so far there's been a, again a couple of bills two three i can't remember that there will continue i believe to be changes going forward because what happened in this case is uh you know the majority just went grabbed everything that they could right and then as stuff isn't working they're going back and fixing it but i mean just just as we talked about a little bit ago about this 11 year old boy right i mean this this is what the democrats do they embrace a progressive vision that's out there and then something happens an innocent person dies or you know so, someone you know suffers the consequences for it and then they're like oh okay well let's back off a little bit right it, this is what happens when you have such imbalance inside of a state in this case because of gerrymandering you have uh you know the the progressive ideologues who have have exercised disproportionate power within the majority and this is what happens it's like they're trying to run a business with no business plan you know it's like hey this is a great idea but there's nothing behind the scenes and then they wait for it to fall apart and they're all in cahoots and say, ah, it's not that bad. Is that what's going on? I, I don't, there's so many things that are going on that don't make sense. That's why we have you on. Uh, Congr Congressman Schneider agreed to come on uh, next oh, month. I, I'm going to ask him the same things, you know, because people come on here, I, you know, I, I ask, all I have is perceptions. And then w once I talk to somebody, then I form an opinion. Certain people will not come on this show, and it's certain people like, you know, Julie Morrison, Susan Garrett, Prue Beidler, uh, Nancy Rotering. That little click there 
when I say click, you can say no comment, uh, Senator. <laughs> but I don't know their personal relationships. Oh, with okay. Other, right? oh, okay. <laughs> no comment. Got it. It just seems to me there's this click or group of people that glob on to certain social issues uh, that don't make business sense to play through just to get votes. And that's why a Republican in Illinois, it's, you know, what can you do? How do you fix? Things have to get really bad in order for a Republican to win. When I say really bad, I'm looking at New York City and I'm looking at Chicago, the smash and grabs, malls are closing. The the uh, the corporate stores are saying, screw this. I'm not doing this anymore. And all the stuff's going to exit. Is that going to be the point when, you know, re Republicans can come in and install law, law and order, Senator? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. If I did, I'd be a millionaire. But uh, I, I mean, that is the fear, right? Part of the problem is a lot of people assume that a city as big and as vibrant as Chicago can't die. And that isn't the case, right? I mean, we've seen this in South Africa. We saw this uh, in Johannesburg, uh, whatever the capital of, of South Africa, I'm blanking on it at the moment. But I mean, criminal gangs took over the inner part of that city and the government essentially moved out of the city, moved 30 miles north to set up a new location and just gave the city to the gangs. Uh, and, you know, and, and so that city is essentially dead now. It is possible for it to happen. And I'm praying that it doesn't happen here. County state's attorney race this this November, Eric Reinhardt versus Mayor. Your thoughts of, of the importance of that race? Well, I've uh, I've met Mary. I've, I've gotten to know her uh, a little while now. I, I really like her. She is somebody who you know people need to understand. She's never run for office before, right? She is a victim advocate. That's what she kind of started off with, trying to help victims and ensure that they would get justice. And she she worked in the state's attorney's office after Eric Reinhardt came in. She left because of just how poorly she thought the place was run. I mean, Mary used to be a Democrat back, you know, uh, a long time ago and, you know, saw really the dysfunction within that office, began casting about for solutions and realized, you know what, I'm really uh, more of a Republican and I'm certainly not an Eric Reinhardt Democrat, even, you know, if I'm still a moderate. And so she has decided that she wants to do this and do this on behalf of victims, do this on behalf of families, helping make sure that justice is served to those people that it's appropriate to do so. I, I am um, very supportive of Mary. I'm hopeful um, that this cycle, we're going to be able to see uh, the, you know, the quest to help make sure that victims are defended, take center stage in this particular race. But here's the thing. I mean, you do have to remember J.B. Pritzker is a billionaire and has uh, proven himself willing to write massive checks to those people who are on his team. And I believe that Eric Reinhardt, especially with his strong support of the Safety Act, um, is going to get help from J.B. Pritzker. And, you know, we're going to have to help make sure that we do everything we can to educate our friends, neighbors and family in order to make sure that we can break through the money that is likely to be coming from JB to help try to prop Eric Reinhardt up this year. Joe already tried to talk me off the ledge. She can win, right? I Oh, I I firmly believe she can win. I mean, look, she's a she there there are uh, individuals out there. Not only is she accomplished, uh, she's an expert in her field. She has the support of our former Republican state's attorney whose office she also worked in and is, you know, now a judge. But also the fact that, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think people are don't want what's happened in the city of Chicago with Kim Fox, uh, with the gangs and such to be exported up here. Um, you know, we, we already are seeing kind of too few cases of the law being enforced now. And I, I hear stories from some of the members of the judiciary and things like this about things that they're observing out of that office. Uh, and I think that, you know, coming up this summer, you know, when 
when, uh, you know, Eric Reinhardt's colors, true colors will continue to shine through. I mean, I think he is running entirely on kind of the platform of prosecuting the Highland Park massacre shooter, right? That he's going to do that. He's going to stand up for trying to make parades safe. And, and that's going to be his entire kind of platform. Um, and at the end of the day, there's going to be plenty of other examples, I think, where his office falls short in standing up for the rights of victims and those people who have otherwise uh, been maligned by the criminal element. And uh, there's going to be an opportunity for us to show his, him for his true colors. Well, let's let's change issues to uh, another big thing that I think is a big issue for all of us in Lake County. Taxes. What's going yeah. on in Springfield? It sounds like they're they're trying to raise taxes again. Well, so the governor every year does an introduced budget, right? So he he puts forward a budget as what he thinks is a starting point. So right, remember the governor is the administrator of all of our different agencies across the state. So they go through the agencies and they say, look, you know, DCFS, you're not doing a very good job, and you know, what do you need to do different, and how does that, well, how much money is needed? So they put together a budget overall, and interestingly enough, the budget that the governor put forward increases spending by just over a billion dollars and increases taxes by just over a billion dollars. And if you look at it, uh, the expenses that the governor has put in for trying to address the migrant crisis, uh, because we're a sanctuary state and, you know, we've been getting these migrants shipped up to us from Florida and Texas, is about a billion dollars. So my message has been uh, the governor wants to raise taxes on you to spend it on migrants whom he invited and welcomed here because he said early on, we're going to be a welcoming state and and, and bring all these people in. And now we're in a such situation where the mayor of Chicago is going to be uh, kicking them out from the shelters. I don't know what's going to happen with them. Does that mean they're going to be living on the street in tents? Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a real tragedy, but I mean, it's real simple when you're talking to your friends and neighbors. Governor wants a billion dollars in taxes and he's going to spend a billion dollars on migrants rather than. And, you know, here's here's another really interesting thing. So I don't know if you know this, but we provide free health care for any migrants under the age of 18 or age 42 and above. Now, don't ask me why those lines. It was originally did that. But if you are a migrant and you're under 18 or if you're over 42, you get free health care. There's no co-pays. There's no, there's no shared costs of any sort. You get to be on Medicaid. You get to go to a doctor and get everything paid for. Now, I'm assuming if you look at your health plan, you have a copay, you have an out-of-pocket deductible, and so forth. Migrants don't. And guess what? Because it's on Medicaid. Now, normally, when a poor person is on Medicaid, 50% of that bill is paid for by us here at the state, and then 50% is paid for by the feds. Because these people are illegal immigrants, 100% of the cost is paid for by us here at the state level. So we've provided free health care, which guess what? So if you're somebody who's a migrant and you have a bad heart and you know it, where are you going to go? You're going to go to Illinois because you know whatever you need, that's going to get paid for. So we're, we're just a magnet. It, it's it's ridiculous. And so that's why I, I strongly encourage everybody to say I'm opposed to any sort of tax increases until you get this other stuff fixed. So, so the Trust Act, what was the reasoning behind that? I mean, we asked the Democrats, too, on that. Like, what? why can't a police officer ask if you, you're, you're supposed to be in this country or not? Yeah. So, I mean, remember Rauner signed this and, uh, you know, so at the time, uh, it, this has been, I, I think that the, that part of, of the issue with that is, has been, there has been this accusation of, of racism because disproportionate number of migrants are of Latino descent. Right. And so I think that there was this expectation or this fear that if you allow for local law enforcement to be able to enforce those types of rules or ask those things, it would make it less likely that they would call the police, less likely they call the fire department if, you know, the building's on fire, things of that sort. And I'll say I, I am probably a, a, a victim of somebody who 
is uh, it was was had that kind of fear but back so 15 years ago i was on a motorcycle i was in mundelein and i was going through an intersection a car turned um uh, on a red light came straight into my lane and pushed me and my bike into oncoming traffic so i have a spinal cord injury i have no feeling or function in my legs but the person left the scene and it is believed, we don't know because the person was never caught, but it is believed that that person was probably an illegal immigrant and that they left the scene out of fear of what might happen. Uh, they get caught there, you know, they realize they made a mistake. Does that mean they're going to be deported? And they just ran, left me laying in the middle of the road. And so we, we do want to create a circumstance in which if there is truly an emergency that you police or uh, that there isn't a barrier for police or fire to to be brought in to try to address a circumstance. However, a, a big push at the time behind these uh, welcoming cities and things like that was done by the Latino community and out of fear that then you would have law enforcement or stuff targeting people based on color of their skin or their or their background. This border crisis, Senator, you got a magic wand. They're letting them all in so they can, I'm, I'm guessing, vote Democrat so they can get more voters. That's what I hear. I don't know if it's true or not. But what's the downside to processing these? If we're paying for it anyways, why can't we at least, you know, document who these people are uh, w when they're coming through? What's the downside to doing that? I mean, that is an issue of the federal government. That's what they ought to be doing. I mean, I'm... I build the wall, please. I mean, that that, yeah. that is something that we ought to be doing. And, you know, we need to change these policies like what we have here that is actually encouraging people to come, right? They come, we give them, we're giving them gift cards. We're, 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 we're giving them a place to stay. We're giving them free health care. I mean, that's ridiculous. And at the end of the day, our states should not be making the federal government's job even harder uh, at, because of providing these incentives like Illinois has done. Let's talk about the Invest in Kids Act, Senator. Sure. Yeah. Um, this was a, a, a something that started, I believe, under Governor Rauner and actually had the support of at least Speaker Madigan and some of the other Democrats and had the support of the Archbishop of Chicago, if I recall. Yeah. Um, and they they kept it for a while under Pritzker. But then they just the bill to renew it just died in committee. So they never actually took a vote. They just let it die in committee. Why don't you talk a little bit about what that act did and the repercussions of letting it die? So, uh, as we all know, not every school district is the same. I'm assuming that a lot of the people listening to this chose to live where they live in part based upon the schools uh, and the the quality education that would be there. Um there are plenty of failing school districts in this state, and a lot of them are in poorer areas that have uh, people who cannot afford to move, right? They'd be moving too way, far away from their job, or they just simply cannot afford uh, that house or apartment in an area that might have a better school district. So their kids are stuck. So what we did, I, I was actually one of the negotiators on school funding reform for, for Governor Rauner back in 2017. And what that uh, what we did was we put into that bill a program that allowed for a tax credit scholarship. So if you lived in a failing school district like Chicago Public Schools, if you lived in that district and you wanted to send your kids to a private school but couldn't afford it, right, you would be able to apply to try to receive a scholarship, a needs-based scholarship, so that your kid could leave that failing school and go into a, uh, a regular, a, a private school that was successful. And that program, we had great success with that program, but uh, the vehement opponent, my biggest opponents, most vehement opponents to that, is uh, CTU, Chicago Teachers Union. Um, they are opposed to any competition at all. Right. They want to make sure that they're maximizing the money that they come into their coffers. They want to maximize then the kids that are also coming to there and that are under their control. And so they did not want the competition. And at the end of the day, uh, it, at least to date, um, we have not been able to get that program renewed because of the union's vociferous opposition to that. They have strongly lobbied their own members uh, or the members, that, you know, kind of in their areas and the, the people that they are contributing to. 
uh, to to be opposed to that. And you know, so it's been the the speaker and the Senate president have so far not put it up on the board for a vote. I think uh, because they weren't sure whether or not it would pass. Plus, uh, because of the opposition from the unions. Does the Chicago Teachers Union did they are they starting to lose some power? We saw uh, in the primary last week that um, they 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 supported the uh, Mayor Johnson's tax the referendum, tax, right? The mansion tax and it failed. And their candidate for state's attorney is uh, last I checked losing by a very narrow margin in the Democratic primary. Clayton Harris the third losing to Eileen O'Neill Burke. So are people's are, is there hope? Because it seems like they were kind of becoming the new Madigan with electing Brandon Johnson and, and killing all these bills in Springfield. Is is Are people catching on to CTU here? Well, uh, CTU is very ideologically driven. Uh, and you can tell that from their platform and what it is that they've held out there. I mean, they 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 weigh into, you know, affordable housing and and uh, all, all kinds of random you know, issues that have nothing to do with education itself, right? It, they, they get into those areas. As a result of some of these kind of, uh, of far out areas that they it, have embraced, I think some people have just not interested in blindly following them down whatever progressive path that they're you know going to take them. I mean, look, Brandon Johnson barely won, right, against... Uh, his opponent uh, at the end of the day, Chicago is very divided right now, but it's very divided between what I'll refer to as the progressives on one side and the pragmatists on the other. And as the the progressives be continually embrace the ideology and that ideological perspective, I think the stronger that it's going to to help the pragmatists to uh, and the you know the p people who are just practical at the end of the day. Uh, to actually reject the things that they're, you know, proposing. Now, it's one thing to, to have a movement that rejects something, right? We've seen that, as we you mentioned with the mansion tax, we saw it with the fair tax uh, that Governor Pritzker pushed a, a, a few years ago. It's something else to have this kind of coalition of pragmatists be in favor of something and to decide on what that is, pick a leader and pick a direction. That is going to be a harder task and it's going to take a longer period of time. Senator, why don't Republicans get off their butts and vote? Uh, so, I, I mean, this this is an issue that, um, you know, we've had for a while. It, it's kind of apathy within the party. Um, that was actually one reason why my race was as close as it was this last cycle. Um, had the Republicans, particularly the part of Cook County that I represent, come out to vote, it, it would have been a wider margin. But they were... I, Donald Trump wasn't on the ballot. And as a result, they stayed home. I, I think that this has to do a lot with this kind of disproportionate attention that people give to cable news, national issues, and don't educate themselves about what's going on at the local level, right? People, I, I remember when I first got elected, I would have a town hall and people would come in and they would complain about two different types of things. They would either complain about what was going on at the federal government level, or they would complain what was happening at the local level. And I finally had to start taking, you know, right at the beginning. And I'd have to say, okay, um, I do, I am not a federal official. I am not going to comment on, you know, whether or not Donald Trump's latest action was a good idea or not, because I have no say over that. Similarly, I am not going to comment about whether or not the, the Lake Zurich mayor should have allowed the lifetime fitness to go in next to your neighborhood or not, because that's a local issue. And I don't have anything to do with that. I deal with state issues. Here's what those are. And I'll comment on those. But if you bring a question up that's outside of that in one of these other two areas, I'm not I'm just sorry. I'm just not going to comment. And, and that has helped. But I, I think that the death of local media um, the death of the newspapers, the death of, of people consuming local news and, and only digesting what's happening nationally and then taking that and running that down. I mean, that's one of the reasons why my district has changed as much as it has in the 15 years, uh, well, 15, 20 years that I've lived here. I mean, when I first moved into the area, 
I remember Dan Duffy running for office in, in my district. He won 67 33. I mean, this was a hardcore Republican area. And now you have, you know, in the last election cycle, you had J.B. Pritzker win by 10 points, right? That's been the movement. That's been the switch kind of in this area. Um, a lot of that has to do with with people that I know who don't like Donald Trump. They didn't like he, the, you know, his tweets and his stuff like that. And, and then people take that and translate it into, oh, well, you're a part of the party, then you embrace whatever I didn't like over here. I'm going to reject that. I remember Tom Morrison, uh, who's great conservative representative from Palatine. Uh, you know, he won, I think, was it 2018? I think he won his race by 43 votes. And he was going to the door, door of people who would say, oh, you're a Republican. I'm never voting Republican again because I want to send a message to Trump or whatever it is. And Tom would sit there and say, you know what? I, Donald Trump has nothing to do with this. I, I'm working at state level. Here's what's going on. He would have to take 10 minutes to try to explain to people about that. And then they go, oh, OK, but just for you. Right. The amount of work that it takes for a local candidate to differentiate themselves from what's happening at the national level that they may not like it, and, and explain, well, the state's just a fundamentally different beast. And I, I'm, I'm my own person. It's a challenge at, at times uh, and takes a lot of, of work, effort and money. Well, it's marketing and branding. It's. I don't even know what the Republican Party is. All, here's what I'm looking at, Senator, is I'm looking at Reinhardt, the uh, the, the last uh, election I had to go in and vote, showing my showing my signature, which took three times to get through. And why the hell can't we use our IDs for that? You need an ID for food stamps. Why do I, why can't I put my ID in to, to vote? But I see Reinhardt getting twice as many uh, votes in as as Cole and Joe's telling me that doesn't matter in a primary is that is that true that's why I'm asking like why why aren't we motivated enough to come out and say you know what this public safety is an issue but it's not enough issue to get get out get my ass off the couch senator yeah so in, in my in the area where I went my wife and I we went we voted early and uh we banked our vote and but there was literally no contested race on the ballot other than for president of which had been decided because Nikki Haley had stepped out as the last uh, challenger to Trump. So there was literally no reason for us to go other than to maintain my eight of eight voting record in the primary, right? To, to be able to, uh, for us to say that that we do that. And yes, I am a Republican, despite the fact that sometimes people don't, don't like what I've said or, or the way I voted on something. And uh, you know, and so there's a lot of people who have skipped for that reason. Um, there has been more uh, contested races on the other side of the aisle. And as a result, that gives pe some people more of a reason to, you know, actually come out and get involved. But at the end of the day, people are doing this because they don't feel like their vote matters. And you know what? Um, in the last election cycle, I knew that Joe Biden was going to win our state. That was pretty clear. Um, I still showed up and voted and voted for president, regardless of the fact that that didn't matter, right? Because at the end of the day, it was about the principle. It's about the the issues I stand for as a Republican. I'm a Republican because of uh, the principles of Ronald Reagan. That's what I grew up on. I'm you know in my 50s. And I remember when Ronald Reagan... I was in elementary school and the issues he stood for, and that made sense to me. And those are the 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 principles that I continue to stand on. And as a result, going out and voting, even if in a particular race, you know, it's not going to matter, is important to me. Is based on the morality of it, based on on uh, uh, you know, based on the fact that at the end of the day, I want to always be able to tell my kids I did everything possible I can to stand up for our republic. We need more people like you, Senator. <laughs> we, we don't have enough. We, we yeah. need more. Joe, we're closing up. Any last uh, questions? No. Uh, Sen Senator McConkey, McConkey, I can't believe I'm no. getting that right. I, I appreciate you. Uh... How do we point people to learn more about what you're trying to 
inform the public on? Where do we send them, Senator? Forest Podcast. <laughs> we got to get Joe a better internet connection. We got. <laughs> we, we we're in Lake Forest. We can't afford it. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Senator, where uh, do we send people? What's your website? Uh, so my website, senatormcconkey.com. That's the official side website that uh, tells people kind of all the things that are currently happening at the state. Uh, on the political side, it's danmcconkey.com. And uh, it's M-C-C-O-N-C-H-I-E for those people who don't know how to do it. But Google has done a pretty good job of taking people who write K-E-Y or something like that at the end and getting them to the right place. Senator, thanks for putting up with us on the Lake Force podcast. Oh, I look forward to it. Next Thank time, you. I'm going to have a beer, though, when I do it. Not oh, hell that. yeah. We'll do it live in person. <laughs> All right. We'll Sounds good, guys. The Lantern. Thank you. Cawthorn Woods. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Take you, care Senator. Now. The Lake Forest Podcast is supported by viewers, listeners, and businesses just like you. Michelle Pardo has lived and worked in Lake Forest for over two decades. Michelle's lending experience when combined with her real estate expertise makes her an invaluable asset to her clients as they navigate their home buying or selling process. Call Michelle now at 847-528-8721, 847-528-8721. For the best cannabis in the world, look no further than Iliad Epic Grow. Owned by Lake Bluff's own Rich Ruzich, they are a cannabis cultivation center focusing on hard to find small batch products that will delight both the occasional user and Ganjie. When visiting Michigan, ask for it by name, Epic Products, Exceptional Process. For more information, email info at iliadgrow.com. Laracy and Company CPAs founded in 2010 by Lake Forest's own Brian Laracy specializes in tax preparation and bookkeeping services. Earning the People Love Us on Yelp Award, their process is straightforward. Just upload, review, and file. For a free quote, visit LaracyCPA.com now. That's L-A-R-I-S-E-Y-C-P-A dot com. I'm excited to share with you something special from our Lake Forest community, the Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa, located at 775 North Bank Lane in Lake Forest near Wisconsin Avenue. This just isn't any spa. They offer an amazing blend of traditional spa services plus the added benefit of medical procedures and treatments. In a relaxing and luxurious spa environment, you can enjoy a range of cosmetic and aesthetic treatments. These are all performed under the supervision of top medical professionals. The Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa provides skin care, facial rejuvenation, body contouring, laser hair removal, Botox, dermal fillers, chemical peers, and much more. What's great is that each treatment is tailored not just to enhance your appearance, but also to address specific skin concerns and to promote overall well-being. So if you're looking to pamper yourself and take your beauty routine to the next level, give the Aesthetic Lounge Med Spa a call at 224-768-8028 or visit them at their location on North Bank Lane. It's an experience your skin will thank you for. We'd also like to say we're thankful for our Patreon supporters, Otto, John C., Helen, Herrick, and J.M. 